onto my book for 1976, Two Strand River by Keith Maylard, and featuring one of the earliest known non-binary characters. Set in Vancouver in the 1970s and published in 1982, I can say that, wow, Canadian lit has not changed much at all. We had characters with intersecting storylines, everyone at some point had a serious identity crisis, magical realism, indigenous characters that are used to further development of the white characters, Colossi. All the characters mildly unsatisfied with their life and trying to find the thing that they are missing, queer elements, incestuous moments, dreams, many question marks, fairy tales. So yeah, Camlet hasn't changed much at all. The story follows a cast of characters, Alan, a non-binary, hairdresser, his two sisters, Amy and Betty, the husbands, Amy's daughter, Jeannie, who is a beloved tomboy, and Leslie, who is Jeannie's librarian. I really loved the character development, their voices, and sometimes even their lengthy monologues. I loved Jeannie. She was precocious, smart, sneaky, and was more perceptive than the adults in her life realized. I loved Alan. Anytime Alan was happy, I was happy. Anytime he was sad, I was sad. Alan is such a precious character. I struggled with some of the plot points and found that every 50 pages I either really enjoyed it or really struggled. By the end of the book, I was really tired of the constant back and forth of the book, so I skim read until the end, which is sad because the end was written beautifully, but I really struggled. I struggled a lot with a lot of the magical realism. It was beautiful, but sometimes forced or formulaic. The indigenous characters were stereotypes, if at times benevolent ones, and the book itself was so odd, so reflective, so internal. I enjoyed a lot of the passages where the characters were questioning their identity or simply just questioning why their identity had been had to be questioned at all, but at times it felt really long and I was impatient to get to the next part of the story. So many heartwarming moments, like when Jeannie affirmed Alan's identity and he affirmed her expression of her identity. I take delight in the fact that most characters in this book are queer, bi, or gay, or have an experience of that kind. Sweet, somewhat Freudian, and oddly nostalgic. I liked it, but I didn't. I skim read paths and I ate up others. Hard to articulate, but if you've read Canadian Lit, then you'll know what I mean. On to the two books that I read for 1977. The first one is Dancer from the Dance by Andrew Holloran. I adored this novel, which I realize now at the end of lots of period accurate racism and, feti and fetishization is a position of privilege. This project has told me that although reading 100 books from 100 years of LGBTQ plus history seems like a great idea and a wonderful exploration of my ancestors, uh, a lot of the people published during this time were cis, white, able-bodied, gay, and for the most part, racist, transphobic, biphobic, and ableist. And whether it's from the characters or from the author, it hurt then, and it hurts now. Dancer from the Dance begins with two letters between friends. One, still living in New York, is updating his friends on the drama, the gossip, the hookups, and the breakups. On page 12, it reads, quote, I am in fact so depressed that last night, while Bob Chanovich was sitting on my face, I began to think how futile life is. No matter what you do, it all ends in death. And everything truly is, as Ecclesiastes says, vanity, vanity, vanity. Of course, that only made me burrow deeper, but still to have the thought, unquote. And from page 12, I was hooked. So many readers these days are tired of New York as a setting for a book, and that I understand, but listen. Holleran brings New York to life in this novel. Few authors have so artfully rendered New York as the heart and hidden beast of my memory five years ago. This long, sprawling book goes on and on and on about men shirtless in the summer, sleeping in the parks because it's too hot to sleep in their apartment, fire hydrants being water out onto the street, and soda cans cooling in the fridges of bodegas. There's something Proustian about Holleran's writing, which feels odd to say, but he writes in such a worshipful way, going over every detail again and again, with such care and attention, that you really can feel the craft of it all. Quote, The greatest drug of all, my dear, was not was not one of those pills in so many colours that you took over the years, was not the opium, the hash that you smoked in the houses at the beach, or the speed or the smack you shot up in Sutherland's apartment. No, it wasn't any of these. It was the city, darling, the city itself. And do you not see why I had to leave? As Santayana said, dear, artists are unhappy because they are not interested in happiness. They live for beauty. God, was that, ste was that steaming, loathsome city beautiful? And why... Finally, no human love was possible. 
but I was in love with all the men, with the city itself. This book certainly had its flaws, a lot of it sounds the same. The racism, the sex, the characters just go on and on and on and on. Sometimes it feels a bit self-important, but somehow still satirical. It's a hard book to recommend, because you'd either love it or you'd hate it. That is to say, this book is not a fast read, but a slow, meandering one. Compete with a nameless narrator in the style of Daphne du Maurier, I have to say it reminds me more of Henry James or of another great American author, perhaps a little like F. Scott for all the excessive drinking, drugs, and beautiful parties surrounded by beautiful people. Glittering, gluttonous. How will we ever tell the dancer from the dance? Trigger warning for racism, fetishization of racialized people, and a suicide mention around page 220 or so. Let's move on to my next review for 1977. The Joy of Gay Sex by Charles Silverstein and Edmund White. This is the third edition, so it was actually published in 2003. This book is hilarious, both in its tone and sometimes when it gets it really, really wrong. I look forward to reading this book after reading the introduction. The number of times it was challenged, taken to court, censored was really incredible. I know that parts of this book are heavily, heavily edited, and it's easy to tell which parts. They spoke about writing a book that wasn't just a how-to sex manual, but a book that would teach you how to come out to your parents, how to come out at work, how to identify healthy relationships, and how to move away from toxic ones. And then there was this brilliant first line. The bias against the anus is unreasonable. I enjoyed and appreciated the references to gay culture and queer culture throughout history. I loved the reading recommendations. I knew I'd find more reading recommendations as I went along and read more books. And some of the sections of the book absolutely flew by. It was super easy to read and it made me giggle. The aspect I struggled with the most in this book was often its tone. When it came to the topics of unprotected sex, they verged on sex negativity, urging the reader that it was their responsibility to make sure that their tackle was appropriately attired before going to town. There was a real stern tone to these sections, saying that modern gay men don't know what it's like to live through HIV AIDS ec- epidemics and that if they did, everyone would be wearing condoms. Anytime HIV AIDS was discussed in terms of status, disclosure, how to tell one's partner they might be HIV positive, the authors were immovable in their frankness. It is your responsibility to disclose. And it is. But to add a section going over common excuses and then to say these excuses might seem reasonable, they're not. Okay, people are going to have unprotected sex. It happens literally all the time. And if people are having unprotected sex, The absolutely last thing you should do is scare them and shame them into getting tested. So many of these sections around safe sex were so tiring. Like, they're already reading the book, Charles and Felice. You do not need to lecture them any more than you already are. Also, some of the safe sex information in this book is just incorrect. They say that, quote, some men double back condoms to be extra protected, unquote. Don't do that. The friction from both condoms will make both condoms more likely to tear. These two and Chuck Palahniuk in snuff, I swear. There were other amusing parts of this book, like fuck buddies also allegedly exist among heterosexuals, or just the general humorous tone about how your co-worker will set you up with someone who's not your type just because you're both gay. But then after all the like, you will have safe sex or you will get it STIs and die, preachy stuff. We get the sex with animals section, which was alarmingly not as moralistic as the other parts. So, like, the authors don't mind sex with animals, taking pains to say we disagree with the moralists. But if you have unprotected sex with another human being, you're the worst of the worst. I do not understand. I fundamentally disagree with people having sex with animals. I think they cannot consent. And there's so many issues that I cannot unpack here because it's a book review. But like, uh, my god, my issue with the sex with animals page is up until very recently, the queer community had to argue that marriage equality was not a slippery slope and people would not marry their goats or dogs or grasshoppers. My wife in high school had to argue this when Canada legalized same-sex marriage at a federal level. This was not that long ago. So the fact that these authors are just so casual about historical instances of people having sex with animals is frankly egregious. The illustrations in this book were somewhat enjoyable and featured lots of different people, racialized people, people with natural hair, bald, body hair, tattoos, piercings. I just wish there had been more body types, just as for dad bods. 
Also, I totally forgot there's a section that mentions coming out at work and suggests doing it as soon as possible. This is not what I would do, particularly if you are under a probationary period where you could be fired, where you could be fired from work with no reason given. Come out when it's safe and when you're ready. The authors also ask gay people why they're in the Bible Belt, because they're too poor to move, because they live there, because they work there, because they have families there, because they are there, because gay people are everywhere. Charles and Felice, hello. One in every ten children are apparently born queer in some way, hello. Like, I, <laughs> by the end of this book, I was so tired. I gave it two stars. Anyway, I enjoyed some parts of this book, but overall, it was a total disappointment. I'm very grateful that we've come a long way in sex positivity and all the other ways this book manages to date itself. But yeah, uh, turns out this, like, revolutionary text really not worth reading. <laughs> now we get on to something more positive which was the first book that I read for this project, my book for 1978. It was Tales of the City by Armistead Maupin. This is the first and in I think his nine book series of the same name. This was a great book to start my project with because I read it in like two days. It begins with a young woman called Mary Ann Singleton Moving into the now iconic address of 28 Barbary Lane. From there, you have a wide and wild cast of characters that all have different names and they all have different nicknames for each other sometimes. So, to start with, you will be probably confused. Just go with it, it's fine, trust me. Gradually, their storylines start to intersect and it just gets more and more delicious from there. Full of twists and turns, lightning fast dialogue. It is such a beautiful love letter to San Francisco. It was like so breezy and easy to read but then you're reading and one of the characters reveals a secret and you're like wait wait what was that excuse me it was camp cheeky sexy and full of drama drama can be a little like problematic shall we say but it did feel like it was accurate for the characters sometimes when an author writes you can tell that they might agree with the thing a character is saying but in this case it really was just kind of like fodder and i don't necessarily agree with all of it i didn't feel like it was a reflection of Maupin. I adored it and I think it's kind of in the spirit of like Queer as Folk or The L Word or Any Better. I can see why they made it into a TV series. It really does have a script quality to it that I like as well. Maupin in this case really does feel like a gossip telling you all these stories. Some of the characters feel like odd fragments but then you keep reading and you understand more about a character and you get to love them and cheer for them even if they are actually a terrible human being. There's so much here. San Francisco is a character, a city I had just recently visited when I started reading this book, how he takes fairly stereotypical cutouts of characters and turns them into lovely homages. The whole book just has such a lovely spirit to it. It's such an effortless book. Like, it's so easy. Morbin writes not only about gay people, but about an entire community of people even if many of the characters are straight because Morpin was instructed to keep a chart so that the number of queer people was not overwhelming. But this book, when I have a list of like 80 something books to read, made me want to start and finish a nine book series. And I just might. On to the last book that I have to review for this, and it is my book for 1979, The Twyborn Affair by Patrick White. I'm gonna be honest, if I hadn't been socially isolated and my library closed, I can guarantee I would not have finished this book before its due date, but I was, and so I did finish it. The first third of this book was tough to get through, a real slog. Such a slog, in fact, that my copy has sufficient wear to suggest everyone put it down around page 100. I could see why it wasn't picking up at all. Who were these people? Where were they? What year was this? Where is our protagonist? Why does everyone have different names, nicknames, and why do they all refer to each other differently? Who is E and who is A? Why does everyone sign their letters so ineffectually? This book is all about E. Twyborn, who presents differently in three different parts of the novel in the style of Wolf's Orlando. In the first, E. Twyborn is Eudoxia Vastez. Don't ask me to spell that name, it's like a, an age since I read about that character. And then Eddie Twyborn, a stockman in the outback, recently returned from the war. And then Edith Trist, a madame in a brothel. White's writing is at first dense and unrelenting, and then after 200 pages, remarkably easy, 
I loved reading about the Outback and how Eddie's queerness was a catalyst for everyone else. Although admittedly this trip can be done terribly, White seems to do it with terrible care and craft as he does with everything else. I felt like the first half of this book was focused so much on comments on class, colonialism, capitalism, all of those big isms that I could hardly follow along the author's subjects. The second half of the novel felt more readable and familiar. I was finally starting to enjoy myself and finally able to read more than 10 pages at a time. White's lush descriptions of the Australian outback and his rather artful ability to write a thick Australian accent were readable and I flew through some of those pages and fell in love with so many of his images. I felt like he'd finally given the novel room to breathe beneath all his grand ideas. The last part of the novel was the most gossipy, the most delicious, and the most sentimental, a fitting and tender, profound, and bizarre ending works for a book like this. Happy I read it, but would I recommend it? Not really. I feel like any positive review I give of it is more confirmation bias because I worked so hard to finish it. So those are all the books. I'll leave a copy of the list down below if you'd like to check it out. It's not perfect, but it has been expanded, so if you want to take a look, it'll be there. I'll only talk a little bit about the queer and trans movement in the 1970s. To talk about queer and trans activism and then 11 random books seems a little reductive, but suffice to say, the Stonewall Riots in 1969 were a catalyst for lots of progress in the movement. Pride flag was flown for the first time, there was increased bi bisexuality visibility, countries were starting to decriminalize homosexuality, and psychiatric associations were starting to take homosexuality off its list of psychiatric disorders. Overall, in terms of my reading experience, these are all the themes and things that I realized were similar or different about all of the books. In cases like On Being Different by Mel Miller, The Men with the Pink Triangle, and The Female Man by Joanna Russ, there was some real anger at bigotry and radical ideas that queer and trans people would make their own communities. The 1970s second wave feminism movement was in full swing, so that we have The Female Man by Joanna Russ and Adrian Rich's poetry, for what seems to be the first time, we also have happy endings. Gordon Merrick's The Lord Won't Mind ends happily, as well as The Twy Bon Affair, which doesn't necessarily end happily, but there is queer acceptance right at the end of the novel. Even E. M. Forster's Morris, which I have as a book from 1913, the year that it was written, wasn't published until 1976, because the author didn't think it was worth the risk. It has a lovely happy ending too. Tales of the City is remarkably uplifting, warm, and started a nine-book saga beloved by so many people in the queer community, and all of our allies too. The 1970s had some weird and very hard sci-fi. Gravity's Rainbow is so difficult to read, it needs its own companion novel, and The Female Man by Joanna Russ has its definite and unfortunate moments of transphobia that Russ apologized for. An apology I find useless, though I can't really articulate why. Maybe it's because all I could find about the apology when I went looking for it was, she said she was sorry. I didn't look for long because I didn't really have the energy, but her transphobic words are etched into the, her book for forevermore. I think Adrian Rich is also trans misogynist, which is, what, which is partly why I put her book down. I really didn't want the year 1975 of my 20th century queer project to be the year of books that I did not enjoy and are also transphobic. The last theme or thing that I noticed was how sexy some of these books were. Child of the Sun by Kyle Onstadt is filled with sex scenes stitched together with some thin plot. The first quarter of The Lord Won't Mind is just pure sex. Dance from the Dance is also full of sex scenes. The Joy of Gay Sex is, as the title describes, Gravity's Rainbow, which is a book I was reading also for 1974 alongside Kyle Onstadt um, because The Child of the Sun is set in ancient Rome. Yeah, Gravity's Rainbow is a sci-fi novel and has some obscene fetish scenes that meant that it was disqualified for the Pulitzer, which I kind of love, by the way. Like, yes, my book was too notorious and too filthy to be considered for a Pulitzer. Faggots by Larry Kramer, published in 1978, is all about meaningless sex and unfulfilling hookup culture, and even The Female Man by Joanna Russ has some steamy scenes along with The Twy Bon Affair and Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown. This collection is, of course, incredibly cisgender, white, gay, and often male. I'd even go so far as to say a lot of these stories are fairly metropolitan, all happening in big cities like New York and San Francisco or London. 
A few like The Twy Bon Affair or Ruby for Jungle begin rurally, but I think a lot of these books end up in bigger cities. I find for some reason lesbian books a lot more difficult to find for this project, but I will continue my valiant search. I know they're out there. I am still reading a couple of books from this decade, but I have already read one for each year, so I thought I'd call it there, but I will review other books soon. It is an incredible privilege to do this project, and I'm grateful I can bring you all of this content and continue to share it with you. My plan was to read the 1940s section of my list next. I have lots of library books there, but my library's closed, so we'll see where this path takes me. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you soon. Bye, everyone.